Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Jane Bailey. I'm a law professor at the University of Ottawa and one of the uh, co-leaders of Working Group 3 of the ACT project, uh, along with Jacqueline Burkell, who's, who's also, also with us today. Um, this is the fifth, um, the final installation in a five-part um, ACT project webinar series on um, LLMs and AI and law. Uh, prior sessions looked at uh, providing an overview of large language models, um, uh, large language models and legal practice, uh, LLMs and law school, uh, and uh, last week LLMs and judging. All the prior webinars are um, available online in case you missed any of them, and uh, we can provide you with a, a link in the in the chat in case you want to follow up on any that you missed. Um, today's session um, is on large language models, AI, and public legal education. And, and, and to contextualize this, of course, as we're struggling with issues of access to justice, um, one of the things that many of us uh, are asking our, our guest panelists today um, have um, experience with um, is thinking about how, um, how AI and large language models could be used to help better support public access to, to legal information um, and to law. And so I'm, I'm thrilled that we're being joined by three um, excellent uh, guests uh, bringing different um, perspectives um, on, the, uh, on the issue. Um, uh, Jinjie Tan is a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Law at the University of Montreal, where he works as a, a research assistant at the Cyber Justice Laboratory. His research focuses on artificial intelligence and law, access to justice and judicial behavior. Um, welcome, Tan. Um, we also have with us Rebecca Schur, um, who creates legal inf information and legal education content at Educalwa. Educalwa is a, an independent registered charity with over 20 years of experience serving the population of Quebec. Its mission is to explain the law in everyday language and help people build skills for navigating legal situations. And finally, we have with us um, Eric Bornman. Um, who's the director of Guided Pathways at Community Legal Education Ontario, also known fondly in our group as CLEO. Um, CLEO's mission is to produce clear, accurate, accurate and practical information to help people understand the law and to exercise their legal rights. So welcome to all of our panelists. Um, the plan uh, for this afternoon um, is to have each of our panelists speak for about 10 minutes. Um, and then uh, I've got a few questions. We're going to have a moderated um, discussion after that. And of course, if you have questions, you can post them in the, the chat and we will leave specific time at the end for, uh, for, question and, uh, for questions and answers. So with that um, in place, I'm going to turn it over to um, Rebecca uh, to tell us a bit about um, Educalois experiences with and thinking about the use of AI to, to distribute legal information to the public. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you so much. And thank you for introducing a little bit about Educalois. Uh, so yes, just want to underline that we're a nonprofit. We're independent from the government, even though we receive government funding uh, and funding for many other important partners as well. Um, so our, our main tool for providing legal information that's easy to understand and legal education that will help people build their skills in navigating legal situations in everyday life are our websites. So I will just pop those in the chat right away uh, so that anyone who's not familiar can go take a look while I talk. And I did just want to mention as well to give you an idea of our reach. Uh, on our main website for the general public, we had about 8.6 million visits last year, and we have over 1,500 tools there in a variety of formats. And then that's the first link that I put in the chat. The second link I put in the chat is actually a separate website we have for our in-school programming and content. So elementary and high school, we have content for teachers 
teachers. We have workshops that are put on for students by uh, legal professionals that volunteer. And most of our content is available in both French and English. We have experimented with expanding into some other languages like Urdu, Spanish, Arabic, and more. So uh, we'll see uh, how much we can do with that in the years to come. And we do often adapt content to specific audiences. So um, since you know, this panel is in English today. I just wanted to say a few words about English speaking communities in Quebec because uh, there are many, there are people coming from other countries, there are people coming from other provinces and there are people who have grown up in Quebec and someone who is part of a minority language community may also be part of another minority community, like a racial minority. So that's definitely something uh, that we're always thinking about when we're working on content. And that's kind of one of the uh, avenues we'd like to explore with AI. Uh, the ability to sort of tailor similar information to different situations, different audiences, just help us really break things down and uh, adapt it as much as possible to each uh, user who is out there and might find it useful. Um, so I will say we are at the beginning of our reflection and experimentation with AI. Uh, in October 2023, I attended the annual conference for the Public Legal Education Association of Canada. Some people here might be familiar. And there was a plenary on the use of AI in public legal education. It was definitely a highlight for us. It was presented by Professor Amy Salazen from the University of Ottawa, who has uh, presented in uh, a conference for this series. Uh, James Kosa from Weirfolds LLP and Chris McGrath from Tango Work. And it was a real wake up call for us because we heard during that panel that in five years, people will be asking AI chatbots their questions instead of search engines. And for us, uh, that's a, a little bit scary in the sense that we've worked very hard to make sure that our website, our tools, come up first or pretty close to it in Google search results, that's where we get most of our traffic. And that's definitely one of our key indicators for success. Uh, so we know that we need to pay attention to the rise of AI and we need to adapt. We need to figure out uh, how to integrate it into our processes. So I'm going to share some examples from our workflow, uh, things that we're testing out where we're at right now. So in terms of pre-production, you know, in order to create content that's useful and that works, uh, we do a lot of consultations before we start a project uh, to learn more about the, the users, the target audience that's going to be using tools that we're creating in a specific project. So we definitely see AI as a helpful support at that stage of the process. Brainstorming, you know, whether it's suggesting some ideas to get the ball rolling, if we're kind of feeling blocked on something, but also editing down ideas and research into something more manageable if we have too much to work with, because, you know, sometimes we can do our do our, do our job too well. Uh, we come out of consultations with so many ideas, uh, so many comments and uh, suggestions. So um, an example of how AI can kind of help take all of that and synthesize it is that we helped facilitate a reflection day for the Quebec Forum on Access to Justice and Civil and Family Law. So that was an event where diverse stakeholders from across the legal field came together to discuss access to justice issues in small groups. And so students were taking notes during the small group discussions. This was happening all day. This was hours of discussion, hours of content. And so what we did was we used AI. We had an external consultant who also helped with us with that. And so we used AI to synthesize and summarize some key takeaways from the notes that had been taken throughout the day. And that was really cool because it allowed us to have something concrete to share with participants on the day of. Of course, there was a more complete report that was going to be released after. But in terms of momentum, you know, just kind of having something as a takeaway from that day uh, so that everyone who participated and contributed could see immediately uh, their contribution, their participation. Uh, we really thought that that was one cool example of how we have used AI. Um, also throughout the process of creating legal information content, we have something called Innovation Day about three times a year at H. Kalua. So it's an opportunity to take a break from our normal projects and allow new ideas to come to the surface, test new ways of doing things. And of course, AI, uh, that was just uh, a huge uh, topic for that kind of day that we, we spent a whole day talking about AI, testing out AI, mainly ChatGPT, but 
other tools as well. And it really helped everyone in the team just kind of dip their toe in, see the possibilities for themselves, try it out, become interested. Um, and we have a committee right now that's working on a pilot project to integrate AI into our processes more. So at this point, we're developing some guidelines for internal use because for sure with data privacy, confidentiality, copyright, there are all kinds of things uh, that we definitely want to understand more and provide a framework for uh, as we integrate AI into our processes. So for right now, in terms of creating content, I'd say we're thinking about using it more as a sounding board for the human who is working on the project rather than a team member in the project who's doing work for itself. Uh, it's definitely just more for bouncing ideas off of supporting us in the work that we're doing. So for example, um, maybe validating a template or an approach. Uh, one way to use AI is to sort of present it with something and ask if there's something missing, see if it has any ideas, uh, suggestions. So we've tried that out. Or definitely a clear communication. There's a lot that goes into it for sure in terms of choosing information, structuring information. That's probably uh, typically going to be more the human's job. But in terms of wording, one thing that's really interesting about AI is that uh, most of the team are lawyers. The people who work on the content are lawyers or notaries. And so we have legal training and sometimes we can have a bit of a blind spot in terms of, is this, is this simple? Is this easy to understand? So in terms of wording, uh, we found it super helpful to just kind of give ChatGPT, for example, a sentence, uh, a term that we want to use and ask ChatGPT, is that clear? Is that simple? Do you find that formal? or informal, what do you think that that means? Uh, is there another way to say this that you think would be easier to understand? So we've been trying that out and enjoying it. And also helping to transform content we already have into another format. This kind of goes back to what I was talking about at the beginning, just kind of adapting as much as possible uh, for each individual user. Uh, there's something called legal design, which is very much about like centering the user and uh, presenting something in the way that they want to use it and adapting as much as possible to each individual user. So that's a way where AI could support us. Uh, and then finally, in terms of promoting the content that we, we create, this is one area where AI is actually already quite well integrated into our processes for Allô. promotional <coughs> communication. Wait. Pardon, je m'excuse. Okay, we're good. Um, so that's one area where uh, we have someone on our social media team, our social media community manager, Valérie Thibodeau, who is very passionate and knowledgeable about AI. So she's definitely at the vanguard, at the forefront, doing very interesting things for our social media. Um, so we found in terms of taking content, something we want to promote, and then asking AI uh, to help us draft uh, a shorter version, a more sort of attention grabbing version uh, for social media. AI has been very useful for that and also creating clips from a longer video. Uh, there, one tool that we're using is called Opus Clip. Uh, so when we're creating content in video format, uh, if we want to put out a little short on social media to link to that larger video, there's software that can kind of find a part of the video that it thinks uh, will be the most uh, interesting on social media. And then, of course, you can adjust that and make sure that uh, the clip is of good quality, but the AI gives you a great head start in terms of picking what part of the video you'd like to highlight in a short. Um, and closed captioning, transcripts, all those sorts of things, this is an area where uh, we're a little farther along. So I think uh, that gives a good overview of where we're at. And I'm super excited to hear from the other panelists and also from the audience uh, about where they're at, uh, what they're up to. So I'll, I'll pass it off to the next person. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, Eric, we'll turn it over to you to, to tell us a bit about uh, Cleo's experiences in this area. Thanks so much, Jane. And Clio, we consider Educola our sister organization in Quebec. So I think Rebecca has given a very sort of helpful uh, overview of uh, how we are looking at AI in a number of different places. But I, I'm going to focus in on one specific area here at Clio. So a, a way that Clio distributes legal information to the public is through 
online direct to public applications for document assembly, what we call guided pathways. And uh, in Ontario, guided pathways are a leading document assembly tool for people who are self-represented or who have very limited representation. The, these pathways help people to understand their legal rights, fill out court forms and other legal documents, and then identify their next steps. The, they are essentially decision trees, uh, and they reduce the complexity of completing legal documents by asking users one question at a time, using their answers to fill out the forms they need. And those questions are embedded with public legal information to help the user understand the question and the implications of their answer. So Clio is currently thinking about the use of Gen AI to increase the ease of use and efficacy of the guided pathways and doing this in two ways. So first, uh, just to increase ease of use during the interview process, uh, we're thinking about an AI chatbot to provide support to people as they navigate the decision tree. Uh, and then two, uh, both to increase ease of use, uh, but also to improve outputs at the end, uh, we're using Gen AI on an experimental basis to help people generate narrative text uh, to uh, tell better stories using their answers, fictitious answers for now, uh, but to, uh, using their answers to the decision tree questions. So let's start with the uh, second part, uh, what I'll call narrative text generation or, or, or storytelling. So the guided pathways do a really good job of reducing complexity. Uh, it, and But in doing so, uh, it can compromise the narrative flow uh, of the uh, of, of the outputs uh, in the process. So uh, one of the most significant document assembly challenges faced by self-represented litigants is this need to generate narratives or to tell stories in court documents, uh, such as pleadings and affidavits. And effective storytelling is a critical element of legal advocacy. Uh, and then again, but again, one of the most difficult tasks for self-represented litigants. And in that, we have a bit of a paradox, uh, the guided pathways, but in order to ensure they actually provide the information that they need to provide in order to make out their claim or seek their remedy, we need to break the process down by decision tree. Uh, and that very process sort of takes away from the narrative aspect of the information that's collected. So enter Gen AI as a possible solution. Uh, the primary purpose of our sort of experimental project is to try and use Gen AI uh, to implement a narrative generator tool for users of the pathways. And we've approached this project uh, trying to keep firmly in mind the guiding principles that we've, we've had all along for the guided pathways. Uh, we need to make sure it's easy to use. Here's a big one, legally accurate in plain language, uh, ready to uh, serve sort of a diversity or reflective of a diversity of users, including those that might not be able to use the system directly themselves, robust privacy and security features, and then sustainable for the uh, long term. And just a note, we're, we're, we've started this project with our partners at uh, McGill and the Montreal uh, Cyber Justice uh, Laboratory. So last year we started using uh, Gen AI and this sort of culminated in the development of a simple prototype that leverages chat GPT-4 to help users generate better narratives. And I'll stick the URL for the prototype in the, in the chat in, in a moment here. So the, the uh, <clears throat> so basically the prototype helps hypothetical users of a new guided pathway for making an emergency motion in family law court. And I just wanna say something about the process for requesting an emergency motion in family law court. This is a very high stakes process where uh, people have to uh, talk about why they want the court to give them some very serious uh, remedies, the matrimonial home, uh, you know, care of the children. And this remedy is to be given to them without notifying the other the other party, their ex-spouse. And it's in, you know, very 
difficult and harrowing situations where the court is prepared to grant that relief, but they're going to want a lot of information. And so working with our community partner, and we try to build our content as much as possible in partnership with the communities that we serve. So for the emergency motions pathway, we're working with an organization called Luke's Place that helps women and children fleeing intimate partner violence as they navigate the family court system. And uh, we, this pathway is now available on our website, but we have developed a very elaborate and lengthy decision tree to help get all the information pieces <laughs> that are necessary to satisfy uh, to satisfy the court that this remedy is uh, is warranted, this uh, extraordinary remedy. And here again, we face this paradox where in breaking down all these, uh, you know, inquiries and creating all these sub questions, as if, you, if we can call them that, we, we are detracting from the story of the user. And the story is a really critical part of the self-advocacy process. And unfortunately, a great, great many people that are seeking this relief are doing it um, on their own. So the generative AI tool seemed like a, this particular pathway seemed like a good starting point for trying to sort of assess the power of generative AI to basically put all those information points back into a compelling story. And we've had, we've had um, some very encouraging initial experiments. Uh, so the way the prototype works now, fictitious uh, answers are entered uh, by way of the guided pathway. You're sent to a narrative text generator tool, which is built on chat GPT-4. It puts together an affidavit. There are little buttons where you can ask chat GPT to give you suggestions, to reduce the, to make the language simpler, to reduce the emotion. Um, and when you're done, there's a survey that we put together uh, in collaboration with um, professors Hannes uh, Westerman and uh, uh, Fabian Jelena at McGill, uh, which are designed to, which ask the user to, uh, comment or rank the experience on a number of faces. Uh, again, this is using fictitious uh, fictitious uh, data. So to build the prototype, we had done four rounds of testing uh, to analyze how the prototype responded uh, to different formats of data uh, with the instructions. Uh, trying to re the, the tool is limited to the information that's entered by way of the decision tree to re help reduce the risk of hallucinations. Uh, working uh, with our partners at McGill, we tested uh, chatbots developed in ChatGPT4 and Claude. But every iteration, we're asking ourselves the same question: How do we get uh, Gen, I, Gen AI to produce the best affidavit uh, for our um, for our clients? And interestingly, you know, and there's there's been a great many learnings that have come forth from this uh, from these experiments. Uh, interestingly, it does a very good job of identifying gaps and suggesting uh, where further detail might be uh, might be needed. Uh, it does a bad job of dealing with well-crafted information that goes in. So if somebody did, if you had a family law lawyer use the tool and provide this sort of uh, sparkling sort of example of the type of text that should go into the affidavit, it will actually sort of remove some of the details that would have been helpful to the case. Um, conversely, if it's a very poorly drafted, um, if the narrative content going in is, is full of holes and has lots of irrelevant information, it does seemingly a good job of like removing the irrelevant, um, the irrelevant information. So I'm going to put the, 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 um, I, I'm sort of out of, at my 10 minutes or so here. So I'm just going to put the link to the prototype in the chat. I, I will say just one word about the chat bot. So, uh, we're very interested in some exciting work that the People's Law School in British Columbia is doing. They have a chatbot on their website. It's an AI chatbot powered by ChatGPT4, and it is trained exclusively on their content. Now, we're not ready to use it in the same way as the People's Law School, but we're very interested in making this a companion for users uh, for tech support as they navigate the pathway and training it on our our guided pathways help content and all our library of uh, essentially redacted emails from you know several years of running uh, um, running running an email support service for people using uh, the guided pathways so uh, you know I guess final final thought I'll just put the URL is that this would never 
be made available to the public as part of the guided pathways until it went through an independent privacy impact assessment, threat risk assessment. So that's a critical step for us. And I'll just maybe leave it there. My phone singing, telling me to stop talking. So. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, uh, uh, Tan, I'll turn it over to you to, to say a bit about the, the work that the Cyber Justice Lab is, is doing to, to use AI to help the public gain uh, access to legal information. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. I'm excited to talk about what we are doing here at the Cyber Justice Laboratory. And today I'm going to focus on uh, a specific tool called JusticeBot. It's an AI tool designed to bridge the gap between uh, legal world and the general public. So JusticeBot works uh, similar to Clio's guided pathway. It's uh, ask users a series of questions and try to understand the specifics of their legal issues. For example, if a user have a housing dispute, it might ask the questions about the nature of the disagreement uh, any relevant communications or the terms of the lease agreement. And then the system will provide uh, tailored legal information based on the uh, user's situation, also including the relevant laws and the example of similar case with a summarization of the case. This information could be used for helping users understanding their uh, situations from a legal perspective evaluating the outcome of their dispute, choose what to do next, uh, prepare for their legal proceedings, or if they don't have a dispute, they might simply understand their rights and obligations. Justice Bot is uh, accessible online. Uh, it's through justicebot.ca, where I will send the link to the chat afterwards. It has over 30,000 users after its first launch in July, 2021. According to surveys at the very end of the user experience of JusticeBot, 86% of the users who interact with JusticeBot uh, reported that they would like to recommend this tool to others. So this positive feedback really shows the tool's usefulness in providing accessible legal information. The, uh, the JusticeBot online version is focusing on the housing law dispute in Quebec but the methodology behind it could be adapted to many different areas, providing similar benefits uh, to those who are facing like consumer uh, dispute, employment issues, and more. And by uh, continually updating or uh, expand the scope of these tools, uh, it could be a dynamic resource for the users who need legal information. And if you want to learn more about this methodology, uh, Professor Hannes Westerman wrote a whole thesis, it's like 500 pages long, to describe all the details in developing, evaluating, and the potentials of this system. As uh, mentioned before, uh, the large language model, of course, have a huge impact to the AI and the law uh, research field. After ChatGPT was released uh, November 2022, uh, it shows great language ability to uh, to the world and also seems like it has the potential to use uh, in the legal field. We conduct a study comparing ChatGPT and JusticeBot, discussing the difference between the two tools uh, in terms of language understanding, accuracy, completeness, trustworthiness, safety, and ease of use, et cetera. These findings were published in the paper ChatGPT as an artificial lawyer, with a question mark, uh, we found that ChatGPT and JusticeBot complement each other pretty well. ChatGPT have a hallucination problem, which affects its accuracy, completeness, trustworthiness of the legal information it provides. Uh, actually, in our experiment, the legal information related to legal articles are 80 or 90% wrong. They are made up the, the legislation in Quebec, uh, but ChatGPT have excellent understanding ability that could help the users to describe their situation, even when the description of users have some typos or, or confusion. And uh, for those users who cannot describe their situation in a well-format paragraph, 
ChatGPT could uh, uh, have conversations with the users through different rounds of conversations to understand what the users actually need. On the other hand, Justice Bot have unparalleled accuracy because it's based on expert system or decision trees. So its content is deterministic. It's always the same if you provide uh, the same situation to the system. But there are also some constraints of the Justice Bot. As the number of the legal pathway increased and more content was fed into the system, uh, users might find it difficult to, uh, to choose the correct answer and to find the question related to their situation. And also creating and maintaining the legal pathway also involves cost because uh, we need human experts to translate legal provisions to easy to use, easy to understand the legal pathways. And also after law update, like what happened in housing law in Quebec this year, uh, the pathway also needs an update, which also requires uh, manually uh, work for that. So we begin to explore a hybrid approach, use Justice Bot as a very core to maintain uh, its accuracy, uh, but also use language models to assess in different aspects of creating and using these pathways. In a paper published last year, From Text to Structure, using large language models to support the development of legal expert system. And our team explored using large language models to turn legal provisions like the Quebec Civil Code, a specific legal article into the legal pathway. We found out that the uh, large language model have 40% accuracy rate in understanding the logic of legal provisions. Additionally, 50% of the provisions could, uh, could put into use with minor adjustment. So you could really reduce a lot of cost for human expert to write everything from scratch. Another interesting discovery uh, is that we didn't realize this before, but when we're comparing the pathway created by human experts and with those created by large language models, there were times when large language model created pathway were correct well, the human expert actually misunderstood the structure, the logical structure of the legal provision. So this could be uh, uh, really bring benefits on both sides, which reduce the cost and also increase the reliability uh, of the system. We also explored to use uh, language models to help users to use the uh, uh, JusticeBot tool in a paper bridging the gap, mapping native, uh, layperson narratives to legal issues with, with language models. We explored to use language models to help users find the correct legal pathway that suits their, uh, suits their situation the best. So I believe the, the combination of large language models and justice bot uh, have many possibilities. Uh, the justice bot could act as a core, as a knowledge base, uh, to provide accurate and verified legal, legal information. And uh, large language models could be used to help developing and maintaining the system, but also help the users to use it along the way. Uh, uh, as uh, what Cleo did, we could also use uh, the infrastructure of JusticeBot uh, as a knowledge base, and then use language model to generate message based on the infrastructure of JusticeBot. This is called the Retrieval Argumented Generation. We're doing an initial experiment on this. Hopefully it could reduce the hallucination in the, in the message generated by large language models. But before I put this into use, that of course requires a, a lot of verifications to make sure the, the tool is safe for the general public. So we believe through those explorations, we can ensure the accuracy of the legal information and uh, reducing the cost of maintaining and use uh, of those tools. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so lots to think about in like a sort of a great um, sort of spectrum of, of, of examples and perspectives and you know, different working approaches, which is amazing. Um, I, I, I'm gonna pose a question for those in the audience if you uh, if you have a um, if you have a question, you can post it in the in the chat as well. 
Um, I, I'm going to ask a question and then I'll, I'll, I'll let each of you um, sort of give us your 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 insights on it. Um, one of the what the first one is if it, if there is another organization out there that's thinking about using AI to to provide the public with access to legal information, um, in and I and I and I when I can find you by saying you can only give them one piece of advice. Um, I wonder what piece of advice you would give them. We'll, we'll start with Rebecca. Well, I think for me, what I would say is start exploring it as soon as possible. Uh, don't let the fear and uncertainty about the future stop you from testing things out and taking steps forward and things like that, because ultimately, I, you know, lawyers, there's a lot of risk aversion. Uh, there's a lot of wanting to do things perfectly, but uh, not participating fast enough is also a choice that can also have risks and, and consequences. So um, I think there's definitely ways, things to do to feel more comfortable, like creating guidelines for proper use around the things that we've been talking about around like data confidentiality and accuracy and uh, all, all those kinds of things. So creating those guidelines so that people feel comfortable testing things out is, is one way to uh, get in there and start exploring. Um, but ultimately, I think it's, it's really that uh, Cheryl Strauss-Einhorn has a framework for making rational decisions in the face of uncertainty. So uh, I looked into that and to apply it to what we're talking about today, I think this is kind of the first step where we're talking about how AI is relevant to public legal education organizations, our mandates, our work. Uh, so in order to not get bogged down and overwhelmed, I think people just really have to kind of identify a specific avenue that they want to explore and then gather information specifically for that and reject anything uh, that is not helping them move to forward towards that goal. And then, you know, that goal can change and evolve and there can be new goals later on. But uh, I think if someone tries to do like a canvas of everything that's out there before they get started, there's going to be a lot. So I think it's best to, to kind of pick an objective and allow that to sort of filter out uh, the, the excess so that you can, you can get started and get going in one direction. Mm, that's great. Great advice. Uh, Eric. <clears throat> Thanks. So I guess something that I didn't appreciate maybe as deeply as I should have at the outset is that generative AI doesn't reliably recreate results. You can, and I hear I'm talking about the larger models that are sort of at the, the sort of forefront of the technology, not something that's been sort of developed on a bespoke basis like what the folks at the Cyber Justice Laboratory have done with the Justice Bot, but like take for example, Chat GPT-4. Uh, you could put the exam, exact same elaborate input into it many times and each time you get back something slightly different. And whatever process you adopt needs to reflect this reality. And this is a bit different for those of us that are in the, the plea space where we spend a lot of time worrying about edge cases and revising content to navigate these, to try to help as much as possible, while also navigating the line between legal information and advice. And, and then we have this gen AI technology that won't give us the same answer every time, even to the same question. And so while I don't want to contribute to the uh, unnecessary anthropomorphism of AI, it does sometimes feel like working with a student or a new lawyer, a very good student or a very good new lawyer. and and. Recently, I was listening to the People's Law School in BC uh, talk about Beagle Plus, and they review their chats, the chats every day, and it was something that I could relate to. It reminded me of sort of my years at a general service uh, community legal clinic here in Ontario, where you would be reviewing the work of the intake team on a daily basis. And and I think I, I was listening to uh, uh, Margaret Hagen at uh, Stanford's Design Lab uh, speak uh, on a podcast the other day, and you know, she was talking about an emerging view to working with the technology where you sort of experiment sort of in the lab. Uh, and then the next step is you sort of move to sort of this co-pilot or human in the loop phase where you're you're there watching what's going on and, and, and before you, you, you move on to sort of a wider release. And that's certainly sort of aligned with what we were thinking here at Clio. So I don't know, does that count as one piece of advice? Uh, it's not the same as uh, 
Yeah, no, that that's really helpful. I, I uh, um, the the point about replicability, I think, is 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 really is really important. It it's not uh, it's not like when you put like two times six into the calculator. Um, yeah, so that's really important to think about. Um, thank you for that, um, uh, Tan. Um, I'll, I'll let I'll offer you the chance, obviously, to uh, to, um, uh, to to comment on the advice. But we also have a question in the chat about the uh, bridging the gap paper, um, asking what corpus you used for the pathways and um, example descriptions. Uh, if you want to talk about that as well. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think my advice for the for the question. Uh, it's pretty similar and related to uh, Eric's answer. I think accuracy is really important because we need to understand the difference between legal expert system and uh, the large language models. Uh, large language models like GPT-4, of course, sounds really cool and is at the very frontier of the research, but it do have some limitation if you want to provide legal information for, for lay person because lay person do not receive legal education as we do. If there are uh, like false information, it might uh, lead to a wrong action or to a, a certain result because of that. And they don't have uh, enough ability to verify the information provided by the tool. So we really need, we really need to do it at the first stage uh, to make sure everything is, is accurate. And uh, it's also related to the, the trustworthiness of the tool, because if a lay person use uh, the system once and the information output is wrong, is incorrect, it might be difficult for them to use the tool uh, for the later on circumstances because they already lo lost the trust uh, to the tool. So uh, that's the reason why we keep Justice Bot as a core and we could wrap it around with large language models in different aspects, but the core of accuracy have to be maintained anyway. Uh, regarding to the to the question of the paper, uh, the paper the data set is collected through the JusticeBot interface. When users go through the legal pathway in JusticeBot, they might realize there are some questions are not covered by the tool. So there is a chatbot at the very end. They could type in what's their situation and uh, what they want to find. And among the I think it's over one thousand messages sent by the users, there are some uh, messages are actually linked to certain legal pathway. They just didn't find it. So we annotate it by ourselves to link the message sent by users with the legal pathway already exists in JusticeBot and then use BERT to train the model. It's not a large language model, but it's more like a, a traditional natural language processing technique. Hope that answers your uh, question. Thank you. Great, thank you, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I uh, it 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 really the the trustworthiness factor is, you know, um, it's similar to it's similar to to other things, right? Um, if if we if we go to an organization or, a, and, and it's high stakes for organizations, right? That where where it's really built on public trust, um, uh, and uh, and you know, any if you go to a human and they give you bad advice you're not going back to them um one of the one of the concerns sometimes i think with with uh with large language models and 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 it's not just members of the public who can be mistaken we we've all read the stories about the the lawyers who just popped you know cases in and they turned out to be made up um so uh so it's it's a it's a the, really that's a really um important important point to think about because there's there's a lot of um a, a lot of benefit can be had and a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of harm can be done um and that's one of the things in in prior conversations in this in this series that people were talking about um and i think it sort of echoes a number of things especially that you, that you said rebecca about this idea that we need to um it, it, it really think carefully about what it is that we're using large language models for, um, right? Like, what is it? What are the um, uh, it, maybe 
using them to sort of give the answer to a legal question as if it were a legal advisor. It's not really what we should be doing, but it can help us in, in, in so many other ways, like, like the examples that you provided, like helping people tell stories or figure out how to break things down or um, th those sorts of things. So I just, this is all really, really helpful. And it's, a, it's great at the, the, this finale um, uh, webinar that really so many things that have been talked about have, are, are really coming together in such a, such a clear way. Um, the, the next question I was going to ask you um, uh, was about, um, uh, is about trust. Um, and it goes to, uh, it's connected with the, the, the point I just made and, and whether you think people's trust in legal information provided by AI depends in least, at least in part on whether they actually trust the organization that's providing it or providing access to it. Um, and, and I wonder if you could comment if you think that is the case. Um, what are some of the most important ways that, that public legal educators um, can earn public trust? Rebecca? Yeah, um, so for sure, I think it definitely does. I think um, the law is different in every province. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. There, There's a reason that there's a public legal education organization or many in every single province. It's because uh, the law is different and we all have our own expertise in our own jurisdiction. So um, certainly we've spent our whole life as an organization building up public trust and you know people come to us they read our information they understand it they take action on it they see that it helped them and they come back um, so we definitely don't want to put that at risk we want to leverage that but I do think what all of the options that we've been talking about today are really about integrating uh, LLM or AI as a support uh, continuing to use our human expertise and understanding and empathy as the foundation um, because ultimately like I think the the fact that we are thinking about the risks and the issues uh, shows that we care that we understand that the stakes are high as uh, you mentioned Jane like we know that the situations in which people are going to be coming to us and wanting to use our information are super high stakes, are super important, are super stressful. Um, and so if we can sort of demonstrate that we are continuing to provide the quality that we've always provided, the accuracy that we've always provided, but we are taking advantage of new functionalities to serve you better, to perhaps adapt what we have uh, to you and your situation better, uh, then I think it's certainly possible to maintain that trust and to leverage it. And um, in terms of, yeah, keeping it simple and easy to understand, that's an expertise that we have as well, in addition to the legal accuracy that we definitely want to make sure that we keep uh, putting that forward and anything that we're going to be doing with AI is going to have to live up to our standards for ourselves as well. And um, so I think the what does AI not have that we have? It's our humanity. So I think that if we if we put that forward and we be human and we connect with other humans and we use it as a tool when it's helpful, but we um, maintain our foundation and, and our presence in the process, then I think the trust is maintained and it's all for the benefit of our users. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, um, Eric, what, what would you want to say about that? So everything Rebecca said, <laughs> yes. Uh, so the question, um, uh, does it depend on whether they trust the organization providing it? Yes, I I, I hope it does. Um, and, and in fact, I think I think it does. And so, how do you earn public trust? There are there are a few factors. Uh, they're interconnected. Uh, you know, as Rebecca sort of said, it starts with good content, um, clear, accurate, practical. You know, here thinking, ease of use. You know, task complexity, plain language. Uh, clearly articulated scope, uh, clear about the currency of your information, providing channels for support and feedback. Uh, and inevitably, though, I think it comes down to your reputation 
in the community and with frontline social sector workers and the justice sector and government. Um, you know, Clio uh, is a community legal clinic in Ontario, so we're a part of a system of civil, civil legal assistance, public legal education, uh, community organizing, law reform uh, with deep roots in communities across Ontario. Uh, we try in our content creation process and our maintenance content maintenance process, we try to uh, connect with communities and engage with intermediaries, people who are uh, working with, uh, you know, those, those, those folks that uh, are most in need of assistance and may have the greatest difficulty accessing uh, legal information and advice uh, through sort of, uh, you know, conventional channels and sort of staying active in network networks of community members and practitioners and speaking more directly to the technology i think it's also you know acquiring badges of diligence i think a privacy impact threat risk assessment is is critical where you're collecting sensitive personal information uh and you know and that in turn feeds into validation and certainly for the guided pathways links to our content from government uh from uh sort of the court court forms web page and community service providers uh, play a you know a critical role in building up the trust of uh, the uh, tools that we're uh, making making available. Uh, you know, and, and just the trusted intermediary piece is is, is really important for for Clio. Uh, you know, low income and sort of so socially isolated people are most likely to seek out or rely on in person support from. A trusted intermediary such as a community worker when looking for information and, and, and assistance and so uh, we spend a lot of time trying to connect uh, with those folks so that they can make our tools available for the people that they see yeah that's a that's a great point too that that um that it isn't always that the individual with the problem that is is you know directly accessing but they're they're going through another trusted organ initial trusted organization that may not have expertise with respect to law um and you can they can it, it's it, it in some ways the you know that puts even grave greater burden on the public legal education organization in some senses because then the community organization that's sent their someone who's depending on them to you um, is also depending on you so it's a it's a it's a it's a, a lot it's a very important um it's a, it's a very important uh social legal function that your organizations are performing that's for sure um tan i'm gonna come over to you and and i'll ask you about this question but it, i feel like there there's a question in the chat that i feel like kind of feeds into this question about trust which which asks whether uh, retrieval aug augmented generation um, or curated local legal materials rather than the internet using those as the as the base of of your models is a is a promising way to to ensure uh, reliability of pu public le legal education responses uh, from AI which I would hope would think in turn uh, obviously would uh, improve uh, trust. Great, uh, thank you. First, I will ask the question whether uh, the, the trust in legal information provided by AI depends on the reputation of the organization. I think the answer is, uh, is yes, because people do, uh, you know, uh, that, that's the power of a brand. If an organization always provides uh, good quality legal information or the help to the users, users will uh, gain more, more trust towards these organizations. And I think that, the uh, you know many factors affect this kind of trust is the first is about transparency and accountability. Uh, so the the organization really needs to make how the tool works uh, you know transparent to the public, other than using it as a black box. User doesn't know exactly where does the information came from, and also uh, as Rebecca referred to, I think using. AI to editing videos and post on Instagram. So this is a really good way to engage with the community because uh, right now we found out that there are some really good tools are not being used that much because users doesn't know the tool exists in this world. So if uh, there are more users uh, trying this tool and feel 
uh, it's accurate, it's useful, the word of mouth will play a role here and will increase the trustworthy of the uh, tools and also the organization. And uh, the last point I want to say is uh, maybe provide privacy and security measures for the users. Because uh, when designing AI tools, um, I'm not talking about uh, like non-professional or non-profit organizations, but for like private companies, they usually have a tendency to collect more information than they need. Like providing legal information sometimes of course refers to the personal details or the personal information to, to provide the answer. But there are more general questions like the water leak in your apartment or a bed bug issue in your apartment. You really don't need to collect that much information from the users. So maybe just stay low and uh, you know, try your best to provide information uh, without asking for too much personal information from users. And for the, for the question in the chat, is using retrieval augmented generation uh, is a promising way to ensure reliability. I'm not sure about the word ensuring because uh, the, the language model is really, it's really difficult to make it 100% uh, accurate, but there are many ways and the many researchers that try to, uh, try to reach that goal. Retrieval augmented generation is, uh, is definitely a better way than uh, generate based on the data collect from the internet because the, uh, the information in the retrieval augmented in, uh, generation is organized and it can be verified before by humans. And there are also ways to use agent-based approach to use another, another large, large language model to verify the result generated by this large language models. And this loop could go on for multi-rounds Hopefully, it could increase the accuracy, but right now, I don't see the, the ultimate way to ensure the reliability of the, of the result. Thank you. Yeah, so techniques for improving the situation, but nobody's offering guarantees. Um, I love, too, the point that you made about um, building trust uh, by not over asking people for information. Um, it, that's really come out of, I've done a fair bit of research, uh, Jackie and I both have with, with young people over the years. And, uh, um, and they regularly talk about the fact that they, that they're, they don't understand why they get asked for a certain kind of information. They can't, they can't see why it's relevant. Um, and uh, and that certainly does have an impact on uh, on on how they feel about the about the service, and so it makes perfect sense that that would be, uh, you know, similar in uh, in this in this kind of context when people are, especially when people are dealing with uh, can, what can be very harrowing um, personal um, intimate uh, situations. Uh, so the the last question I wanted to pose to the to the group. Um, are there uh, any resources? So we've posted some links in the chat as as you were as you were talking. Um, but are there are there other resources on the issue of of AI and public legal education that that you would recommend to others who who might be interested in just continuing the journey to to learn more about this? Um, Rebecca, I see you've already started posting. Do you want to do you want to comment on 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 those? Yes, really quick. I just uh, so what I've shared, the first link is the webinar that I talked about at the beginning that really kind of put the fire under us and opened our eyes and made us realize that this was really something that we needed to get started on sooner rather than later. So that's the first link. And then the second one uh, is a webinar put on by Tango Work to explain Beagle Plus behind the scenes, how it works, the chat bot for People's Law School in BC that we've been talking about throughout. And I'm glad that we've been talking about it because it is super exciting and super inspiring. So um, people who want to learn more about the tech side, the back end side, uh, that second YouTube link uh, will give you more information about that. And then, of course, I mean, you can always go to People Law School's website and test it out. So I might also put that in the chat, but I think uh, someone might have already done that earlier. So. Yeah, that's great. Um, Eric. <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, I put a link to Clio has a research database and 
admittedly, there's not very much, maybe nothing on AI there, but there's a lot on the fundamentals of public legal information and education. And I, I would suggest that those principles uh, still apply and can be to, to, to our work. Um, I think we can talk about it as work that is, is starting and, and will continue using this, uh, using this new technology. Uh, otherwise, uh, the uh, Cyber Justice Laboratory has some uh, some great uh, video uh, video links. Uh, the Legal Services Corporation has a podcast called Talk Justice. Uh, I would highly recommend that everyone who's interested in this space subscribe uh, to that podcast, uh, Talk Justice. Uh, there's a there's a database. Um, I'll just put the link in here. Uh, it's an AI legal information uh, database uh, that's been uh, curated by the um, Legal Services National Technology Assistance Project in the United States. They've done a great job sort of marshalling uh, uh, resources. And then just in terms of the state of the field, a uh, quick plug, uh, I think uh, the New York Times Hard Fork is a great uh, uh, podcast to keep on your list. Uh, and um, you have to pay for it, but the Legal Tech News is also a, 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 a great uh, periodical for uh, staying on top of how, uh, mostly for big law, but um, the the ideas there, I think, you know, can be uh, ruminated on uh, for, for sort of inspiration in our space. Yeah, I, I love that point, and I feel like each of you has sort of made it um, in, in a number of different ways, but this this idea that um, the, the, the technology is meant to suit your mission and, and your analysis of what your organization does and what your principles are and what your, and what it is that your, what your mission is, um, and that, that the technology doesn't drive your mission, your, your mission drives the, how the technology gets engaged with, which I think is, is really, uh, important and often gets lost sight of because we tend in in technologized spaces to to feel like um if we're not engaging to the nth degree then we're somehow behind you know and we're not um uh and we're and you know sort of we're not we're not um innovating as much as we should be and that this this sort of approach that looks at the technology from the perspective of of the mission of what it is that you that you want to do i think is so such an important uh message Atan, do you have uh, other resources that you might recommend? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, because I am a PhD student here, so maybe uh, my, my uh, interest is focused more on the research side. So the, the few links I, I'm going to share in uh, its research institute. The first is the Access to Justice Lab. They did a lot of interesting research to see the impact of AI to human decisions and also how to use AI and empirical uh, evidence to show that AI have a potential impact to access to justice. And then there are also the codex, uh, uh, I think it's uh, at MIT, uh, at, at Stanford or MIT, sorry. Uh, it's uh, about legal information and computational law also include uh, with some research in AI and law. Then is the Birkin Clean Center for Internet and the Society. I subscribe for their uh, newsletter. They often talk about the, the interaction between technology and society. I think it's, uh, it's good to keep an eye on the impact. And uh, so next time when you use the tool by yourself, you will realize that there are limitations and also positive and negative impact to yourself. So thank you. Thank you very much. So that's a really nice, rich, um, diverse array of, of resources, which I hope everyone will avail themselves of. The All the links will be provided, um, as was noted in the chat, all the links will be provided afterward um, on the uh, on the ACT uh, project uh, website relating to this to this webinar. So so if you didn't have a chance to sort of copy all of those things, you, you will have access to them afterward. It's time now for us to to uh, to wrap up. Um, we uh, unless there's like any one last burning question. Um, 
Uh, I want to, I hope, ask everybody to join me in, in thanking our, our panelists for a really um, thoughtful, thought provoking, um, engaging uh, discussion around uh, uh, AI, large language models, and, and, uh, and public legal education, all sort of oriented to the, to the big question of, of improving uh, access to justice. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you to the audience for for being here um, and to uh, to all of those who participated in the in the series.